Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you here in the house of the Lord, and it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Just a few uh, announcements this morning. Remember, come and go Christmas Eve communion, which is, believe it or not, snuck up on us, and it's this Thursday at 5 o'clock, so from 5 until 6 p.m. The sanctuary will be open, and you may come as a family group and receive uh, communion together. Also, there will be a Christmas Eve candlelight service that will be streamed uh, via Facebook Live with scripture reading, songs, and prayer on that evening, and uh, I invite you to take part in that. Uh, still taking donations for the Hands of Mercy Food Bank at this time. They are greatly needed. Um, in relationship to that, uh, Sharon and Joe Penner. Sharon runs the Hands of Mercy Food Bank and her husband is recovering from stroke and they still need much prayer. So be in prayer for uh, Sharon and her husband. Um, Sunday evening Bible study will resume uh, January the 3rd, 2021. So it will not meet tonight or uh, next Sunday evening the 27th, but we'll resume on the 3rd, and Wednesday evening Bible study will resume on January the 6th at 7 p.m. Are there any other announcements that we need to make this morning? Catechism question of the week, what is forbidden in the first commandment? The first commandment forbids the worship of any other God than the true God. Now may the peace of Christ be with you. Let us pass the peace.
Let's stand together and join in the call to worship. With all our hearts, and we are glad. Uh, You may be seated. Our scripture reading for this fourth Sunday of Advent comes from the Gospel of Luke in the first chapter, verses 26 through 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, and he will be great, and be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and is in her sixth month. And she who was called barren, For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. We come to the Advent wreath today, remembering that the first candle reminds us to be hopeful. The second candle reminds us to be peaceful. The third candle reminds us to be joyful. And now the fourth candle has been lit symbolizing love because our all-powerful God is merciful and loving and cares for the humble. Let us pray. Merciful God, we come to you this morning and we thank you. We thank you for the blessed hope of your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you uh, for the peace that he makes for us with you by forgiving us of our sins and for the joy that he brings to our lives. And now on this Sunday, we praise and honor you and adore your name for the love that you have bestowed upon each of us by sending your Son. Father, we thank you and praise you and adore you that you do indeed pour out your mercy and your grace upon the humble. It is in your name we pray. Amen. Oh, I wanted to announce, forgot to announce... It's, I want to tell you why you got to look at David instead of Beth this morning. Uh, you might have been telling her that. She's been very sick, sinus infection, and she just thought instead of sharing with you all that she would let David help us today. So be in prayer for Beth. I'm sorry, David. So you all thought you'd done something wrong and had to look at him. <laughs> so. Let's all stand and continue our uh, service with worship and praise. Page 78 in your hymnal or on the board. I love you, Lord. Come all ye faithful, page 249.
remain standing now and affirm our faith together. We will be using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Continue with praise and, and worship. Page 265, the first Noel. We'll do the first, second, and sixth verses. Just a reminder, once again, about uh, our offering. The plates are at the rear of the church, and the noisy offering this month goes to Operation Reach. Or excuse me, I, I knew I was going to say that. It goes to the Hands of Mercy uh, Food Bank. So let's continue to remember them with our, with our gifts in that way. Uh, it's now time to take prayer requests and praise reports. Uh, some that were lifted up this week, if I can ever get all my, my notes out here. Uh, Gina Ellis, Olivia Ellis's mother, uh, 
you all remember Olivia who directed the choir here several years ago. Uh, her mother has had COVID but is recovering from that now. But now the entire family has gotten COVID from her. So be in prayer for that family. Also uh, be in prayer for Gene Raymer. That's Jamie Raymer's father with prostate cancer. Uh, he had some scans this week and the scans were positive in nature. They believe the cancer is contained, but pray for Gene Raymer and Jamie and, and the entire family. Also remember uh, Ed Western. He's experiencing some health concerns. That's from Jenny. And uh, remember Dottie Hedgecock. Dottie is, uh, she's, is it Billy's sister-in-law? That is that who Dottie is? Yes. Uh, anyway, she's related to Billy Wyatt somehow, <laughs> I think. Is that right, Mary? You don't know? Okay. But anyway, Dottie's recovering from heart surgery, and we need to remember her. Also, uh, Mike Day, who has had COVID, is now recovered, and he's been cleared to go back to work. A word of praise along the same lines is the Larry Brown family, who are friends of Joe Morosco. Uh, he and his family have also recovered from COVID-19. Are there other prayer requests or praise reports this morning? Paul. So she has pneumonia and her name is Melissa Melissa May. Is that right? Okay, Paul. Anyone else? Ken. Jerry Stevens family and his wife passed this week. Okay, is that Jerry with the J? Jerry with a J or a G? You think people do it both ways. Jerry Stevens in his passing. Okay. Uh, Charlie, the one passed away, that was uh, the Bacons came here for a while. That was uh, her mother. Okay. Yes. I'm going to get to you, Lily. I see you over there in the corner of my eye. <laughs> okay. We'll do that, Lily. Anyone else? Miss Jessica. Okay, we'll keep you in our prayers. And my friend Amy, her daughter, was diagnosed with COVID a couple of days ago. She's going to be in here with her next Katie? Yeah, Amy Lawson's daughter, her niece, Katie. Katie Lawson. All right, anyone else? Well, let us pray. Merciful God, we come before you this morning and we praise you and we thank you uh, for your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, may we remember on this fourth Sunday of Advent that he came and he came out of love and you sent him out of love to redeem us from our sins. So, Father, we thank you for your great love, your great grace and compassion and the mercy that you have poured out on us. And Lord, it is because of your great and endless mercy and grace that we can come before you this morning and confess our sins in the full assurance of pardon and forgiveness. Lord, forgive us of our, of our greed, our selfishness. Father, forgive us of our idle gossip. 
Father, forgive us for not caring and loving others as you have loved us, Lord. Forgive us of all the times that we have placed ourselves ahead of you, that we have placed ourselves ahead of others against your commands. Father, forgive us of the times that we have desired our own way and our own kingdom more than we have desired your way and your kingdom. And Father, we praise you and we thank you for the forgiveness that is ours, that you have cast our sins as far away from us as the east is from the west. Father, we give you praise and thanks for that. And now, Lord, in the power and in the grace and the, in, that is found in the gift of your Son, we lift up these prayer requests to you, and we do so in the full assurance that you hear and, the, and that you answer. And Lord, as the angel said to Mary, no word from God will ever fail. Nothing is impossible for you. So Lord, we just pray for healing and for grace and comfort in these situations for those who have lost loved ones, people facing cancer and, and pneumonia and, and COVID-19. And, and Father, we just lift them up to you, knowing that you care for them and love them more than we could ever imagine on our own. And Lord, we pray for, uh, for Alyssa and for all those who do not know you as Savior and Lord, that you would bring the grace, that you would bring the gift of repentance to their hearts, that they would turn from their sins and turn towards you. And now, Lord, it is our prayer that we as your people might remember as Mary did that we are your servants, that we belong to you, and that yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory and not ours. Help us to remember during this Advent season that there is only one peace, one government that is sufficient to meet the needs of our sinful hearts. Help us to remember that you are the King of kings, that you are the Lord of lords, that you are the one that is in control, Father, and may we yield our lives to you. Teach us to live our lives to your praise, your honor, and your glory. May we ever and always bow down before you in wonder, love, and praise. And as the gospel of your kingdom continues to change us, continues to transform our lives, may it also advance through our lives, Father. May we passionately witness to your Son, Jesus Christ, that your love and grace would be known to our friends, our family, and our neighbors. And now, Father, we thank you and we praise you once again for the gift of your Son, and we close this prayer with the prayer that he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, so we always like to do a little something with the congregation. Church trivia time. <clears throat> Whoever gets this question right wins by we will only do this on one time. <laughs> okay. Oh. What church member, here's a question. Feel free to raise your hand or buzz in at any time. What church member wrote and composed in this, in this public, and was published in this uh, Cantata back in 1987. Anyone? Anyone? Who? What? What? Sir? Joseph Morosco. That would be correct. Joe Morosco, the song we're doing today. Well done, preacher. Well, Joe and I appreciate the sentiment. However, in 1987, I was the ripe old age of two. <laughs> Prodigy. That's what I've been told. <laughs> 
So, but yes, Joe Morosco. So we we're thankful for Joe, and we miss him and all of all of our congregation during this time. But very special uh, moment. This is Christmas praise. Sing we our song on Christmas morning, praises to our Savior. Long ago God's love was born, here to change our behavior. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. joy is ours unceasing praises to our Jesus join us now in glad rejoicing for he hath redeemed us Alleluia 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 We're Son and Holy Spirit, praises to the Father. Saved by His grace and not our merit, praises to our Savior. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. a blessing. Thank you, Joe, for writing that and for sharing that, and thank you for men. Uh, that harmony you all pulled off, I'm sure, did not happen by accident. There had to be a lot of rehearsal and practice that went into that, and you all did a wonderful job. Thank you. Um, we come, once again, on this fourth Sunday of Advent, we come to Paul's letter to the Philippians, and the second chapter, verses 5 through 11, to what is called the, uh, the Carmen Christi, what is called the, the, uh, the hymn to Christ, and it was used in the early church as an apt summary of the life and ministry of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so far, we've used this passage to look at the call of Christmas, the plan for Christmas, and last week we saw the heart of Christmas and this Sunday, on the fourth Sunday of Advent, we'll look at the cost of Christmas. And we'll be looking uh, specifically at verse 8, and it takes us from the manger all the way to the cross. Now, it might seem unusual on this Sunday before Christmas to spend it talking about 33-year-old Jesus dying upon a Roman cross on Golgotha instead of newborn Jesus nursing in the arms of his mother Mary and laid in the manger there at Bethlehem. But nothing, nothing could be more important than the cross because without the cross, Christmas is meaningless. Without the cross, the nativity scene is empty. It makes no sense. As the hymn says, as the carol says, why lies he in such mean estate where ox and ass are feeding? And that's the question. Why is he here? Why did God become a man? What, what, what's going on? 
Why does he lie in such mean a state? Good Christian fear for sinners here. The silent word is pleading. Nails, spear shall pierce him through. The cross be borne for me, for you. And that is what's going on. That's apt apart from Calvary. Bethlehem cannot help us. In the 11th century, there was a man named Anselm. And Anselm was the bishop of Canterbury. And he wrote a famous book that was entitled, Why the God-Man? There's some Latin title for it, and I'm not very good with Latin, so we'll do the English, Why the God-Man? Why did he become a man? And the book is a conversation between Anselm and its main character, uh, whose name, unfortunately for us in the 21st century, his name is Bozo. And we all think of the clown when we hear that. But this is the 11th century, so we need to remember that. But that's his name. And poor Bozo couldn't understand. What in the world would demand that God should come into this world and become a man? Why? What possible need would require such a drastic intervention on the part of God? And as Bozo expresses his unbelief, Anselm replies, You have not yet considered the heavy weight of sin. You have not considered that. In other words, Anselm is saying to Boso, if you understood sin, if you'd understood the depth of your sin, the depth of humanity's sin, you would understand why God had to go to such extreme lengths, such great lengths to secure our deliverance from sin. The crushing burden of sin required not just that God become a man in Jesus Christ, but that God and man, as that, He would make full satisfaction for our sin through His obedience and through His blood. Nothing less than that could secure our salvation. That's why Christ was born. That's why God became a man. That's why He lie in such mean a state. If you only have the baby in Bethlehem and not the man of Calvary, you might have a pretty Christmas card and and a greeting card, but that's all you have because you do not have peace with God if that's all there is. The cross, you see, is the reason for the cradle. The cross is the reason for the cradle. Christmas would be an empty celebration apart from Calvary. So let's read Uh, Philippians 2, beginning in verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a, a, a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let us pray. Gracious God, as we turn to your word just now, we ask that what we know not teach us, what we have not give us, And what we are not, make us. We ask in the precious name of your Son. Amen. Perhaps one of the most beloved of all Christmas stories is has to be Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. And being the uncultured swine that I am, I had never heard of this until until I started dating my wife, Lori, and she introduced it to me. And A Christmas Carol is perhaps her uh, favorite Christmas story, her favorite Christmas play. When she was in high school, uh, she was part of a young of the Young People's Theater, I think they called it, in Knoxville, and they performed it at, was it at the Tennessee Theater? The Bijou, excuse me, at the Bijou, where they performed this. And then after we were married and we moved all the way to the foreign land of Carthage, Texas, some 12 and a half, 13 hours from here, and we were working in youth ministry, she got the kids together there and we pre- and they performed a Christmas carol for the church there in Texas. And I'm sure we're all familiar with the story. Uh, 
you know, of how Ebenezer Scrooge is transformed from a miserly, bitter, angry, selfish person into somebody who's filled with love and joy and that is completely unselfish in his giving. In other words, there's a part one to Scrooge's life and then there's an intervention and there's a part two to his life. And the message is that a person, I think Scrooge even says this himself, a person can be changed. And he is changed or she is changed by the power and the love of the story of Christmas. And our granddaughter Rory, who's, who's five now, I can't believe she's five, but anyway, I was talking to Elizabeth on the phone and Rory loves the Grinch. She likes the story of how the Grinch stole Christmas, and so they've watched different versions of the story, and I asked Elizabeth, well, which one is Rory's favorite? And she said, well, hands down, she likes the 1960s version, the animated version, the original one from there. And you know what? She's right. Rory's right. You can keep Jim Carrey. You can keep his version of the Grinch. Uh, you can't beat Boris Karloff as the Grinch, as his voice, and you can't beat whoever the guy's name is, that saying, you know, you're a mean one, Mr. Grinch. Nobody does it like him. And the story of how the Grinch stole Christmas, that's another transformation story, isn't it? You know, remember his heart grew three sizes, however Dr. Seuss puts it there toward the end. And he, he changed from a mean-spirited, uh, ornery, mean-hearted person. Again, there's a part one followed by a part two in the life of the Grinch. The message is the same as that of a Christmas carol. A person can be changed by the power and the love of the Christmas story. Now, what if I were to tell you that it's possible for there to be a part two in your life? That the power and love of the Christmas story, which is actually, in reality, the power and love of the story of the gospel, that that changes hearts, that that changes lives, that it's possible for there to be a part two in your life because of the gospel. And that's what uh, Paul is saying to us there in many ways in Philippians chapter 2 verse 8. The old story of Adam's sin and failure, remember that sin and failure back in the, the Garden of Eden, that story of Adam's sin, that story of your sin, that story of my sin, my failure, it has been overwritten. A new story, a part two, has been written in the obedience and in the blood of Jesus Christ. That's why Christ came. He came to write a new story for your life. He came to write a new story for my life. He came to seek and save the lost. And that's why we must preach the gospel. That's why I must preach the gospel. Last week, we talked about Paul in verse 7. We talked about how Paul was alluding to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, where we read that Adam was created in the image and likeness of God. And then we went to chapter 5, verses 1 through 3, where Adam fathered a son in his own likeness after his own image. So when Paul says that Jesus came in the likeness of men, he's saying that the one who made Adam, the one who made Adam in his own likeness, who was Christ himself, who was there in the beginning because the Word was God and the Word was with God in the beginning. Jesus Christ, who created Adam, is now coming into the world. How? He's born of the virgin. He's born of a woman. Born in the image and the likeness of Adam. Jesus is one of us. And Jesus came as one of us to do for us what the first Adam did not do for us, but should have done for us, which was obey the law of God. So Jesus came to write a new story. In verse 8, our text for this morning, it unpacks how all of that happened. And it begins, if you look at verse 8 with me, it begins by focusing on the humility of Christ. You see that language in verse 8, the very humility of Christ. Being found in human form, he humbled himself. One of the things you may have noticed as we've gone through these verses is that downward trajectory that we see, see in that there in verses 5 through 8. You know, he goes down, down, and down Jesus' steps. You see the pattern there. It begins with Christ who was in the form of God yet did not 
think that or did not count equality with God something to be grasped. So it begins in the heights of heaven, in the form of God. It begins in glory. And we begin by thinking about and meditating on the dignity of, son of, of the Son of God and the deity of the Son of God who dwelled in perfect fellowship with the Father and with the Holy Spirit in the Blessed Trinity. So it begins here in the majesty and in the glory of heaven. Then Paul says he emptied himself. He made himself nothing. He humbled himself. He emptied himself not of his deity, nor of his dignity, nor of his rights or his prerogatives as God. He emptied himself, Paul says, by taking. You know, remember we said addition or subtraction by addition. He emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, literally the form of a slave. And being born in the likeness of men, he took human nature, he came down into human nature, he came down. It's staggering, isn't it? To just, if you sit and you try to comprehend this, if you try to understand this, that the Creator God should become a creature, unite Himself with the creature. I, you can imagine the angels and the Gospels record for us that the angels were with Christ along every step of the way of His earthly life and ministry. You can imagine the angels, they were overcome with wonder as the, their Creator, as their King, the God who fills the entire universe and who created the entire universe, that God becomes a fetus. That's what happens. And he's in the womb of the Virgin Mary and the King of kings and the Lord of all the hosts of heaven is born in pain and blood and in sweat just like you and just like me. Like every other descendant of Adam. That just that blows my mind to sit and to ponder that. No wonder the angels burst into song of praise that night. Glory to God in the highest. I mean, who can help but praise God? If you have Christ in your heart and you see this, who can help but sing and say glory to God? And who could keep silent? But surely, the angels say, surely that humiliation is enough. Surely the Lord will not allow himself to be disgraced much longer. Surely he will quickly display his power and his kingdom. After all, he's David. He's great David's greater son. He's the heir. That's his birthright. But that's not what happened. Paul says, no, he emptied himself. Look at it there. He emptied himself and he took the form of a slave. Not just down into human nature, as shocking as that is, but down further into the menial, lowly work, unlovely work and unlovely nature of a bond servant, of a slave. He came down, remember, in, into the demands of the fickle crowds. Remember, the crowds wanted miracles. Oh yes, give us the bread. We want the bread you gave us yesterday. Feed us. Heal us. They wanted His miracles, but they didn't want Jesus. He came down into bodily need. He came down into physical needs. Remember, he met when he met the woman at the well there in the Gospel of John in the fourth chapter, and he said, "Give me a drink." He's thirsty, and then on, that's a very human thing, a physical thing. And then on the cross, as he's nailed between two thieves there, and he's dehydrating, he's ble bleeding out, and he agonizingly cries out, "I thirst." He came down into this world with a love for the lost. Matthew 9, seeing the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and they were helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And then he came down into grief. He came down into sorrow. Remember there in John chapter 11, as he's at the tomb, he's at the grave of his friend Lazarus. And, and it's the verse that all the Sunday school kids want to memorize. Jesus wept, right? Jesus wept. Being found in human form, he humbled himself. That's his constant attitude. That's his character. He humbles himself. There's no pride in him. He came as the servant of everyone. And Adam, you remember Adam, Adam didn't humble himself. Adam, instead of having humility and, uh, and bowing under the rule of God, what did he do? What did he do? In his selfish pride, he sought his own way. He said, oh, I can be like God. I don't have to obey God. I can be God. So he sets aside the clear command of God. He eats the forbidden fruit and the whole race, 
The whole human race is plunged into sin and darkness. And let's be honest. Let's be honest with ourselves right now. Ever since Adam, and Adam represents us all, he is our representative. Ever since he ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we all bear the family likeness, don't we? The Bible is clear. There is none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned. All have fallen short of the glory of God. We are, by our very nature, sinners. In verse 3, Paul tells us that in humility, we shouldn't, we should count others more significant than ourselves. Count others more significant than ourselves? That's the very definition of humility, isn't it? And we find it awfully hard to do. It's awfully hard to do. I find it hard to do, don't you? It's very hard. There's too much of Adam inside of me. Isn't that something we all need to confess? That you need to confess? It doesn't come easy. Humility does it. We rebel. We are rebels. We shake our fist at God. This world tells us that we're to stand up. This is my life. You can't tell me what to do. We proudly blow our own horn. We're like the guy who scores a touchdown. We, we beat our chest. We pound on our chest and say, look at what I've done. And we do it a thousand times each day with quiet acts of rebellion. And it reminded me of a poem that I had to study, and yes, I said had to study, <laughs> as a freshman in college, uh, that you might know or you're probably familiar with, and it's entitled Invictus. Invictus by William Henley. And one of the lines, it matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Ever since Adam ate the fruit that forbidden fruit, well, that's what we say, isn't it? I'm in charge. This is my life and no one, not even God, can tell me what to do. I will be God. I will be king. I will rule. I am the captain of my soul. But not so with Christ. No pride, no boasting in the second Adam. He did not withhold any affection, any mercy, any of his time, anything of himself. He did not hold back from anyone who sought him, although he was made in the image of God. He was a slave of all. Do you see the humility of Christ? Do you see that there? Second, next, not only humility, but how that humility was expressed. Look at again, verse 8. He humbled himself by becoming obedient. Here we see the obedience of Christ. First humility, now obedience. Down into humility, down into obedience, further down into slavery. The Lord of all creation bowing down under the yoke and the burden of his own law. And this was the plan from all of eternity. God the Father and God the Son and the God the Holy Spirit that got together and God the Son in obedience to God the Father agreed to come and be the Savior. He was born that first Christmas. Christmas itself is an act of obedience on the part of God the Son. He was obedient to the Father. His every word, His every work, His every action, everything that He would do, He would do under the direction and under the obedience, under the governing of His Father, under His design. Jesus Himself says, Gospel of John chapter 5, verse 36. Jesus says there, the works the Father has given me to accomplish. Who gave him the works? The Father gave him the works. The very works that I am doing bear witness of me, about me, that the Father has done what? The Father has sent me. Then in chapter 12, verse 49. I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me. He gives himself, or he, he himself has given me a commandment. He himself has given me what to say and what to speak, and I know what his commandment is, eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. Every word that he uttered, every deed that he did was directed and governed by the plan of God. 
And he obeyed in humility. And more than that, more than the secret sovereign decree of God directing his course as our Redeemer, he obeyed every jot and every tittle of the Old Testament law. He was our obedient Savior, and he kept that law perfectly. Remember how in Matthew 4, Jesus is in the wilderness and he's tempted by by the enemy of our soul. He's tempted by Satan and he's standing in the front of that, right down the barrel of that, and he doesn't flinch. He does not cave in. He was, was, as it says in Hebrews 4.15, he was tempted in every way as we are, but without sin. So he's obedient to the will of God so much so that he would say, even as he faced a brutal and painful death upon the cross there in the Garden of Gethsemane, what did he say? Not my will, but your will be done. He is obedient, Paul says, to the point of death, even death on a cross. You know, I've read that verse and I've always just scanned over it and thought, well, yeah, he was obedient in that he went to the cross. And that, of course, is true. But you start thinking about it a little bit And the obedience of Jesus involves more than that. There's more than that going on here. Paul is talking about an entire lifetime of obedience on Jesus' behalf. And and that Jesus Christ kept the moral law of the Old Testament for us. He did it on our behalf. A lifetime of obedience is what led him to the point of death, even death on a cross. And why was he obedient? Think about it. Why was it necessary that when God became a man in Jesus Christ, when he comes as a baby and he's laid in the manger, why did it take a lifetime of obedience leading up to the cross? Why was that necessary? Why didn't he just show up and die? You know, if that's all there was to it, why not show up and die? A lifetime of of obedience is necessary because I have a lifetime of sin. Don't you? I have a lifetime of disobedience. So we need a lifetime of obedience from a Redeemer to redeem us from every nook and cranny of our lives. You know, you think about it this way. You go to a a court. You go to court of law here, and the best an earthly court can do, they can declare you not guilty, and they may say, well, you're innocent of all charges, and it may be that you're innocent of all charges in that particular case or that particular crime. But when it comes to the law of God, the moral law of of God, none of us are truly innocent, are we? None of us are. None of us are truly righteous. That's what we need, is the righteousness of Christ. None of us have lived our lives in perfect innocence, perfect righteousness. We cannot, none of us have kept the law of God perfectly. And that's what God requires. That's what He requires, is that perfect obedience. And and that requires more than a verdict of not guilty. It requires a verdict of you are righteous in the sight of God. We have to have that perfect obedience. Our whole life, our every sin, our every failure has to be covered. Now you think about that standard. And in light of that standard, who here among us has hope if Our salvation is founded upon our own goodness. None of us. Not you and not me. Your best righteousness, my best righteousness, you know what it will do? It will damn you forever. Your best righteousness will damn you forever. You need the righteousness of another. You need an alien righteousness, somebody outside of you. You need someone else to act for you. You need the righteousness of Christ. That's why he came. That's why he lived an entire life of obedience. And that's what Christmas is. That's what Christmas is all about. Are you guilty? Are you overwhelmed with shame? Do you think God, he could never ever have anything to do with me? Do you think God is finished with you? Is there any hope? There is a righteous Savior. There is a righteous Savior whose righteousness, you know what it does? It covers all your sin, covers all your shame, it covers all of your guilt. 
Christ was obedient in your place. He was obedient for you. And by grace, through faith in Him, His righteousness, you know what happens? It's credited to your account. You got this huge balance on your visa bill or your MasterCard bill of sin. Christ wipes it out. He pays it. And the sin that is passed down to us through the first Adam is washed clean by the blood of the second Adam by His obedience in Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul says it this way in Romans 5, uh, 19. Romans chapter 5, 19. For as by one man's disobedience, one man's disobedience, that's Adam. That's the first Adam. By as one man, through one man's disobedience, what happens? The many were made sinners. That's us. The many were made sinners. So by one man's obedience, the second Adam, one man's obedience, that's Jesus Christ. By his obedience, the many are made sinners righteous and now look how far his obedience went look how far at what lengths it took his obedience how far it took him his humility his obedience now we see his death we need to see his death he was obedient to death where verse 8 how far to death even death on a cross even uh, obedience for jesus required not just that he positively obey the law of God, but that He satisfies the penalty for the law of God that we face. The wages of sin is what? I'm asking you, the wages of sin is what? Death. That's right. The wages of sin is death. It is wrath. It is the curse of God. And He says that the price in full has been paid. It's been paid that you might live. He dies that you might live. You know, all sin must be paid for. It has to be paid for. The righteous justice of God requires, demands that there be a price for all sin. And we all pay, uh, and we will pay ourselves, or Christ will pay for us. Those are the choices. Those are the only two options. Options, either He bears the wrath and the curse of God in your place, or you bear the wrath and curse of God for all eternity in hell. Which is it for you? What will it be for you and in your case? Notice how Christ came down into humility. He came down into slavery. He came down in obedience. Paul says, and he came down into death. But more than that, we have to go further than that. Not just any death, but death on a wretched shameful, painful cross, even to the point of death, even on the cross. And Paul is overwhelmed. Paul is stunned by this because there's nothing more shameful to him, nothing more shameful for a Roman citizen and nothing, far, nothing more shameful or wretched for a Jew than death on a cross. In those days, you wouldn't wear a cross as a necklace, as a piece of jewelry. You wouldn't wear it as a nice lapel pin. That would be, to, to say in the least, it would be very poor taste because the cross was a symbol of horror and shame and agony and death. Death on a cross was so terrible and so shameful that the Roman government only reserved it for criminals and slaves and and rebels. Cicero, a Roman orator, wrote this. He said, let the very name of the cross be far away, not only from the body of a Roman citizen, but from even his thoughts, his eyes, and his ears. That's what death on the cross was. It's in your, it stayed with you. It was in your mind and your eyes and your ears. You heard the pain. You heard the cries. So it is repugnant to them. It is vile to them. And do you see that? And the Jewish people took it even farther. It, it, there was even more of a stigma attached to the horror of, some, of the cross. Deuteronomy 21, 23 says, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And that's the tree is the cross. You're cursed. You face the curse of God. You face the wrath of God if you're on a death if you face death on a cross, if you die on a cross. So to a Jew, crucifixion was a clear sign that God rejected you. 
and that God had poured his wrath out upon you. So what does Jesus do for you? What does he do for me? He goes to the cross, he's rejected by God, and he has God's wrath poured out upon him for you. He is rejected for you. He's rejected for me that we might be accepted by God. What does the old hymn say? Bearing shame and scoffing rude in my place, condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah. What a Savior. What a Savior. Jesus was condemned in our place. He was condemned that you might be pardoned. He died that you might live. Brothers and sisters, make no mistake, that's the message of Christmas. That's the central message of Christmas. This is why he came. This is the answer to Anselm's question. Why the God-man? The cross. That's why. That's why the God-man. The cross. The cross demanded it. The crushing burden of your sin and my sin demanded it. You see how much you're loved? You see how much God loves you? Do you see how much you are loved that He should give His all to pay the penalty that you owe? That's what Christmas is all about. That's why Christmas is worth celebrating. So let me ask you, has your debt been paid? Has God said of you, righteous? You are righteous in my sight through the obedience and the blood of my Son, Jesus Christ. Have you taken God's Christmas gift? Have you taken His Son, Jesus Christ, by faith? Is He yours? And are you His? What a Savior we have in Jesus. Take Him. He is here for you. Let us pray. Lord, we come to You now and we cry out to You for mercy. Lord, we've played with our sin far too long. Lord, we have shrugged it off we, and, and we've carelessly gone our own way knowing and said, oh, you forgive that. And Lord, forgive us of those things because, Father, you have poured out uh, your judgment and your wrath upon your sin, upon your Son, because of the very least of our sins. Forgive those of us who are Christians, Father, for treating our sin so casually. Give us the true grace of repentance, Father. And for those of us who aren't Christians, who have not come to know the Lord Jesus, we pray for you now. Lord, show them their need of a Savior. Show them that you have provided a perfect Savior in the baby of Bethlehem, who is the man who died on a cross at Calvary. In his name we pray. Amen. him number 262 away in a manger we thank you that you were born in a manger some 2,000 years ago. But Lord, as we ponder the manger, may we ever remember that the babe born in the manger is your son who died upon the cross of Calvary for our sins. 
We thank you for that. And Father, as we leave this place, may we go forth proclaiming the babe in the manger, proclaiming the man of Calvary who died for our sins. And now unto him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be all glory, majesty, dominion, and power from this time forth and forevermore. Amen. Yeah, we need to. I'd forgotten all about it. Like